morning. Good to see you this morning. We have a uh, opportunity for me to, what's the expression, chew you out for six years of work. Um, I'm not going to do that. Paul didn't do it with his people. I'm not going to do it with you. It's one of the things that happens. Preachers move on, and this preacher's going to move on. It's just one of those things. Now, right now, though, I want to leave you with some thoughts. The Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, left these thoughts to his people that he talked to in his letters. Of the various letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, which are numerous, we have a number of them that actually have these words finishing them out. He says, finally, brothers. Finally, brothers. Now, finally is not always finally. It's not always the very end of the book. Sometimes it's two or three chapters later. Or maybe that's just a lot of finallys that he's got in that group. I'm not sure which. But he says, finally, brothers, and we want to try and do that a little bit this morning. I want to take a few of the words that the Apostle Paul gave to his people, give them a little bit of a encouragement, give them a little bit of stimulus, try and do better. And I would like and pray that this would be something that would benefit you as well. So finally, brothers, we want to go and, and see this. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, finally, brothers, rejoice. You know, we don't always feel like rejoicing, do we? I remember uh, a funeral that I went to when I was, I don't know, I couldn't have been more than 10 years old. One of the first funerals I sang for, probably about nine years old, really. And I remember my mother complaining about how everybody was mourning so horribly. And in particular, this was a brother in Christ who had passed away. She said, we should be rejoicing, shouldn't we? And she was right, but that's not the human way, is it? The human way is to mourn. The human way is to not be happy. And so here he tells the brethren, rejoice. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Then he says, aim for restoration. And this is kind of in a context that really we don't understand. So we automatically apply it to our time. And in our time, there is vast differences between various groups that call themselves Christian. And in that vast differences between those who call themselves Christian, we have a cry for restoration. Now that is a particular cry that comes from us, or used to come from us. And it's one that we don't cry enough about it anymore and, and express enough anymore. So this is a good admonishment for us today, is to aim for restoration. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Then he says, comfort one another. Uh, we're going to talk about comforting in just a minute as well. Agree with one another. Now, there's a disagreeable subject, isn't there? Agree with each other? Yes. Find out a way to agree with one another and not just to disagree. Actually come to agreement. Live in peace. Now, there's a difficult one, isn't it? We, we, we admonish others to live in peace, but what about me? This is an important one for us as well. So let's go back to rejoice for a moment. The idea of rejoicing is something that's inherent in the scriptures. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. We have plenty to rejoice about in the Lord, don't we? He doesn't just stop there. He emphasizes it again. Again, I say, rejoice. Rejoicing is a very important part of the Christian faith. If you walk into church service on some church service and you look at their faces and you say, well, this is not a rejoicing group, is it? That's very common. We have a morose look or we have a look of seriousness that precludes any enjoyment in the Lord at all. You know, I've, I've been a preacher for 44 years, something like that. The Lord's Supper has always been an amazement to me. I haven't always been standing up in front of the group, watching the group when the Lord's Supper is done. But over the years, I have seen enough where there are some who have tears coming down their cheeks while they're taking the Lord's Supper. Others who have a look of sheer joy on their faces as they're remembering the sacrifice of our Lord and everything in between. And I, I believe that that is an appropriate response to God's gift to us. Some will cry. Some will cheer. All will be affected, though. And so at this time, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let us be sure and understand that we have joy in our hearts. Not just children, not just children having joy in their hearts. We should have joy and revel in it. We should rejoice. And so it is we have Jesus rejoicing for us. Why can't we rejoice for him as well? The su subject of aim for restoration. 
Uh, I especially like this thought, but the question is, restore what? We attempt to restore, well, what are we trying to restore? The faith? I think we've done that already, haven't we? How about the church? Technically, we've done that as well. How about attempting to report, restore spirituality? There's something we need to restore. We've done a great job of restoring the church, the technical things, you know, the little check-off box things. We do the Lord's Supper every Sunday morning. We do our songs without instruments. We have a preacher that gets up and preaches about 30 minutes, give or take a little bit. If he preaches too long, we've got a trap door just in case. And we have all these things in place where we've done that right. But I tell you this, every preacher I know believes the same thing. We have failed to restore the spirituality of the Lord's church. So we have something to aim for. And in here, I would say the same thing. I would encourage you to aim for restoration, attempt to restore the spirituality of God's church. Christian love, I think Christian love has been restored. I think it's been demonstrated adequately. I think it's something though we always need to work on. It's something we need to consider always that we need to do more. Aim for restoration, well, we all need to do that. Not just the preacher, not just the elders, not just the leaders in the church, but all of us aim for restoration. Let's do it God's way. Comfort one another. If I was to uh, pick one subject that we have uh, a difficulty doing in the Lord's church in general, I would say comforting each other would be one of them. Now, why do I say that? I don't mean when we have a hospital visit that somebody's going to go without somebody coming to comfort them while they're sick. We do that well. I'm not saying we don't comfort each other when someone dies. We do that well. But what about comforting each other at the other times? The times when they're feeling badly, when the times when they're sick in other ways, maybe it's a spiritual sickness, maybe it's an emotional sickness, and we have the hardest with that, don't we? That's a very human nature. We don't really like to comfort people when they're having emotional difficulties. See, we don't call it emotional difficulties. We refer to it instead as mental illness. Mental illness is not something we deal with very well in the church. We have a tendency to think it's that person's fault. Kick yourself and get up and do it better. Emotional, uh, well, they call it depression, I guess would be the best way to put it, too. We have spiritual depression as well as emotional depression. Those are the types of illnesses that we have the hardest time comforting each other with. Comfort should be something that's inherent in us no matter what. Something that we just automatically do. It's who we are. Let's think of comfort as a divine consolation. And in fact, that's what Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians. He says, comfort that comes from God. It's a consolation from God. It's God's comfort given to us, and we should represent that to each other as well. Uh, have as your aim to comfort each other. Make it your goal. Make it something that you focus on in your life. When you get up in the morning, you say your prayers. Lord, lead me to someone to comfort today. Give me someone that I can help today. That is something that we should do always. Live in peace. You know, we... we uh, had a whole movement back when I was a kid about being peace is the answer. Peace is, you know, peace is not the answer. Peace is a symptom of the answer. Peace is what happens when we do the right thing. It's not something that we actually achieve through targeting peace. In fact, it was kind of funny. We had the biggest arms buildup in the, in the history of mankind during the 70s, and yet often there'd be a peace symbol on it. Somebody was saying, this is for peace. Uh, friends, I'm not sure I agree with the idea of blowing up a whole city for peace. It just doesn't quite make sense. I understand the history of it. I understand the politics of it. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about amongst ourselves. I knew a brother, a, a couple of sisters, actually, in one church in Southern California. They had somehow gotten crosswise with each other, had gotten so bitter over it, they couldn't worship together, they couldn't fellowship together. Years and years later, when I got together with them, I tried to get them back together again, and they still would not even talk to each other. I got a question. Who are they going to talk to when they get to heaven? Oh, that's right, they might not get to heaven, huh? Because if we can't keep peace with ourselves, we may not be there. We will definitely won't be comfortable there. Because one of the things we're going to find out is there are people there we don't think should be there. Because we're not at peace with them. And we need to be at peace with them. But we need to be at peace with them here. Live in peace. Peace is an important thing. Christ's child was supposed to be coming to guard our feet into the way of peace. Luke 1 verse 59. That's what the Christ child came for. Why shouldn't we be doing that then? Uh, be at peace with one another, he says in Mark chapter 9 verse 50. 
be at peace. Why does he say be at peace? Because they're not at peace with each other. During the time of Christ, there were two major sects, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who were at war with each other on a constant basis and had been for 100 to 200 years. It was an amazing thing. Romans chapter 12, verse 16, we're admonished to live in harmony with one another. Harmony is a little bit different statement than peace, but it says the same thing. Harmony means we have a harmonious relationship. We have something that actually makes music together. You know, I come in from a musical background, and uh, we talk about harmony, and we may not be on the same note, but the notes would fit together, and it would be a beautiful sound when that would happen. So it is with Christians, we're supposed to be in harmony with each other. We're supposed to be having that harmonious relationship. In Romans uh, 12, verse 18, he just flat says, it's possible as far as it depends on you. And I like the way that says that because, you know, sometimes peace is not dependent on me, it's dependent on the other guy. But it's dependent on all of us, really. Be at peace. Live peaceably with all. Now, that would be easy if we could just do that and just say, okay, well, I, I'm going to do that today. It's a done deal. I don't have to think about it again. That's not the way it works, though, is it? The way it works is when somebody does something to make you angry, to make you bitter, to make you uncomfortable, and you immediately think peaceful response. That's not the human way, though, is it? The human response is to think, let me get back at him. Let me hurt them back. That's the human response. Don't be that way. Be exactly the opposite. Be the way Christ would be. And in fact, one of the things to ask is, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? How would he respond? Well, look at what he did when they responded to him the way they did. They cursed him. They made fun of him. They challenged his manhood. They challenged his deityhood. They said he isn't who he claims to be. They spat on him. They did all kinds of horrible things to him, and he did what? Nothing in return except this. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, I'm telling you, when somebody hurts me, they know what they're doing, and I'm going to get them back. That's the way we are, isn't it? No, let's live peaceably with all men. Ephesians chapter 6, he starts off with finally again. This is the passage that leads us into the armor of God. And so he says, be strong in the Lord. I would encourage you to be strong in the Lord as well. Understand that the Lord is our strength. Understand that we cannot be strong in and of ourselves, but that we need to be strong in the Lord. That is first and foremost. And of course it says, and in the strength of his might. You know, we have a tendency to depend on our own strength way too much. That's true in this church as it is in all churches I've ever preached in. I would blame the preacher, but I was the preacher, and I hate to blame myself. The fact is, we have a tendency, though, to depend on our own strengths. We have a tendency to think, I can handle this myself. We cannot. God gave us a family. God gave us a fellowship. God gave us a body of Christ for a reason. We need each other. You need each other. You need to depend on each other. You need to help each other. You need to be the kind of person that will help them as well as them be the kind of person that will help you. Be strong in the Lord, though. That's first and foremost. Depend on the Lord. Depend on his strength, not your own. First Peter 3, verse 8. We have another, finally, from the Holy Spirit. All of you, he says, have unity of mind, sympathy. Oh, my goodness. There have been a lot of times when I've seen members of the church be very unsympathetic to other members of the church. Well, he had it coming. It's his own fault. We've said that over and over again throughout history. I've heard it myself. Maybe the only reason I heard it is because that's what my mom said a lot. Very judgmental at times. We tend not to have that sympathy that God wants us to have. Peter, through the Holy Spirit, says, be, be unified in mind and have sympathy for each other. We also should have brotherly love. Do you know what brotherly love is? This is love that I love you anyway kind of love. It's not the in spite of love of God, but it is a love nevertheless that says I love you because you're my brother. I've seen brethren actually get into fights with each other. I've seen brethren actually call each other ugly names. I've seen brethren actually deny the spirituality and sincerity of their brother. Why? Because they disagreed over something. If you can't agree with me, then you must be wrong. Yeah, 
Maybe that's true, but that's not brotherly love, is it? Brotherly love says, well, I respect the fact you have a difference of opinion, but I disagree with you. And I love you anyway. I love you still. Brotherly love. And by the way, that doesn't just say love only the brethren. What it means is have brotherly love. We should also have a tender heart. Uh, I would pray that all of our hearts would be tender. But you know, a tender heart is something that you kind of grow up with. You kind of grow up with and is fostered by parents that have loving, tender hearts of their own. And if you never had that, then you need to get it from God because you're not going to get it on your own. You need to have the kind of heart that says, I feel for you anyway. I have sympathy for you anyway. I sympathize with your pain, with your needs, with your hurts. And then, of course, one of the reasons we don't have those things is because we don't have a humble mind. Humility is something that the scriptures refer to over and over again. We're supposed to have humility. But we're Americans. We don't have humility. We think we're better than everybody else, and we're right, aren't we? Just ask us. We're going to have an Independence Day celebration here in a few days, uh, a little over a week from now. We're going to shoot off skyworks and fireworks, and we're going to have a great time bragging about how great we are. The fact is, we should have a humble mind. There but for the grace of God go I should be our thoughts all the time. And just because we're Americans doesn't mean we're all righteous, does it? doesn't mean we're all going to heaven. In fact, quite the contrary. We're told that only the remnant's going to heaven. And by the way, you better be careful because you may not be part of that remnant either. You need to have a humble mind. Be humble before the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, though, we're going to finish with this. And finally, brethren, this is one of the most basic principles being expressed in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul, in giving the Philippians this final, gives us something to give us a guidance for all of our lives. Whatever is true in this world in which we have people arguing that the news doesn't give us truth anymore, in a world in which we have a, a news-making machine that seems to try to be creating uh, popular whatever uh, figures there are, rather than actually trying to report the truth, we have what they call fake news and everything. But we need to look at whatever is true. By the way, what do we have that we know is true? Is the New York Times true? Washington Post? No? You're just sitting there like, well, wait a minute, aren't they true? Eh, well, you can believe that if you want to. Let me tell you what's true. God's word is truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus, in praying to God in John 17, says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Friends, we have the truth, but it's not in a newspaper put out by men today. It's in God's word. We need to focus on what is true. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Now, there's a good one. There's a lot of things we could report, but should we? You know, the uh, gossip says, but it's true. We're told not to gossip too, though, aren't we? If it's not honorable, we shouldn't say it. Now, what more could we say about that except amongst ourselves? If it's not honorable, don't repeat it. If it's not honorable, leave it lie. Don't say it. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. The word just comes from the word lawful. <coughs> it gives us the idea of rightness and wrongness. If it's legal... And we don't need to do it just because it's legal, but we need to not do it if it's not legal, should we? Whatever is honorable, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure, <clears throat> this one places it in a whole different category, doesn't it? We're supposed to be focusing on purity, not on evil. I watch television. I repent of that periodically, but then I go back to watching it again. Uh, maybe you do the same. <clears throat> There's a lot on television that's not pure. There's a lot on the internet that's not pure. But I can't blame the internet and I can't blame television. Why? Because I'm watching it. I gotta blame me. I need to make that choice of what is pure. I don't need to be watching things that are not pure. I don't need to be seeing things, reading things, doing anything that is not pure. Give this as a guidance for yourself from now on. Don't deviate from it an inch. Stay on the path of purity always. Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. 
I went to a, uh, an art museum, the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, beautiful place, magnificent place. A lot of beautiful art, and some of it actually is some art you can look at. But there's inevitably art that you probably don't think you probably should look at. And what amazed me is during the height, height of the religious Europe phase, there were so many of these paintings and artist things that were done for uh, cathedrals and churches that were just flat impure, that were just flat sinful exposure of human body. It wasn't what God would intend. It was lovely in one sense, but not lovely in the godly sense. We need to be focusing on what's lovely in the godly sense. If it's just, if it's pure, if it's lovely, whatever is commendable. You know, there's another phrase. We don't really understand it that much today. We should, but we don't. Uh, I remember growing up, if uh, it was not something that you would be willing to share with everybody, then don't share it with anybody. There was also the added attitude that if it wasn't something that was uplifting, don't do it. Commendable is the idea of something that we can, we can actually commend. We can actually recommend. We can actually encourage people to become part of. There's a lot of things that I like that are not commendable at all. I would like rather instead to see them, well, what would be the right word? For, oh, yeah, done away with. I guess that would be the right word for it. I don't need to participate in those things, do I? Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. That's an encouragement I believe that's appropriate for us as we leave part ways. Think in terms of what is good, what is pure, what is right, what is just, what is commendable. Things that are worthy of praise. Is there anything worthy of praise in our society? Not in our society, but there is the word of God in our lives. We need to be worthy of praise ourselves, and we need to be doing praiseworthy things for God as well. And in all things, we need to praise God. Praise him. Not each other, not ourselves, not the preacher, not anybody else, but praise God. Think about these things. These are the things we should be thinking about. And these are the things that should be our guide in our lives, our Christian lives. We have a Bible reading schedule. Uh, I didn't put it out in this particular bulletin. Next week it will come back out again. Each day of the week there's a different verse to read, a different passage to read. You'll read the whole Bible in a year if you read it. How many of you have read the whole Bible ever? A couple of you have. Good. Notice there are the older folks in the congregation. Yeah. We need to read it too, younger guys, okay? Yeah, I'm pointing right down here to the new families, yeah? We need to all read it. I know that Krista tries to read on a regular basis, so good. Corey nods his head, yes, that's what we need. All of us need to be reading the Word of God. But we all need to be looking to God for our guidance, for our encouragement, for our strength, for everything we do in our lives. And I pray that God will bless you as we separate our paths right now. Right now, we're going to offer an invitation. It's a matter of custom. The invitation, though, is not just for baptism. It actually is for repentance as well. That means I want to do better in the future. I want to do right before God in the future. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. And from that, we then change our lives for God.